tired, but oh, so what time do you start normally? Are you an early bird start? Oh, yeah, I'm an early bird, yeah. So I'm, um, yes, I've been mean, uh, getting up and uh, yeah, I sort of run every other day, so do that before uh, eight o'clock and then I can get on with it. But yes, I like to deal with stuff and then take time during the day, you know, do, yeah, or go get coffee. Is, uh, you know, I used to go and love to sit in the, in the coffee shop and just you know read or whatever, but you can't do that anymore. But you can get a coffee at least. <laughs> well, that's it. They're all open now, like drive throughs and stuff, aren't they? Yeah, I've been right. driving to Costa every now and again, trying to get a, yeah. make me feel like I'm still in work, <laughs> even though I'm not. <laughs> um, but people are starting to to join now, uh, which is great. Um, yeah. Give it a couple of minutes, and then we'll make a start. Sure. Um, okay, you should just let me know when when we're ready. Perfect. I did actually get some feedback on the first one that I did. Um, someone mentioned to me that I've been on another webinar. That they said the only reason it was better than our webinar was because during this awkward silence while you're waiting for people to log in, they had a DJ. <laughs> so I was going to log into my Spotify, but then I just thought that would be a bit awkward, that wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, for th maybe Friday. Uh, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see if we get any more feedback like that. <laughs> It is that bit, you know, like, um, yeah, because some of the some of the technology has like a waiting room, and you can have stuff playing or slides, yeah. or whatever. It's all they're all different. That's, That's it. Fun. And you keep, I keep using these tools, and and each time they are, you know, they, you know there's improvements being made. The format layout is a little different, you know, mm -hmm. and stuff, you know, and so yeah. It changes every time. It's know, it the same. It's very, very. Every time I log in, there's something different. Uh, you can now have eight people on a screen. Yeah, um, which is completely so. Yeah, it, it uh, it's good. I prefer Zoom though. Zoom's uh, for video meetings. <laughs> we started off with Teams, but then ended up uh, with Zoom in the end. <laughs> yeah, I think I prefer Zoom. I must admit, but I do, I do some work for Microsoft as well, and they I'm not allowed to use Zoom on that one. They let me use any other platform, but, when not, I don't, but not Zoom. Oh, yeah. I always thought Zoom was part of, like a side product of Microsoft, but. No, 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 no. Much, I know. <laughs> they, they are seen as their main competitor. Ah, oh, fair enough. Yeah, you'd probably get in trouble then, won't you, if they found out you're on Zoom? <laughs> um, but now starting to get people coming through. Uh, no, I mean Zoom have gained enormously in this period of time. Then Zoom is now worth than all the top ten seven airlines in the world put together. Really? Yeah. Okay. Now, obviously, you know their revenues have collapsed, their share price has mm -hmm. collapsed, etc. But Zoom has just Zoomed. I, mean, I, bet, I bet if you put a, a bit of money on Zoom before all this, I bet it's worth oh, a few gosh, rounds, yeah. isn't it? If you bought a few shares or whatever, then yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I know. I tried. I tried doing a little bit of investing, but yeah, I just don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, I feel like it's something you have to be really interested in and passionate about. Otherwise, you just. Well, I started off when I started off as a consultant and a project manager. I what I did was I bought some shares in every company I was doing a project for. Yeah. And, and it was a terrible portfolio because I was <laughs> the share prices were going there. I know it's a long term thing. Yeah. You know, like I had about six companies I worked for, and each of them their, their share price went down after we deployed <laughs> our technology. It was just I'm not only our fault, obviously, but you know, it didn't seem like a I've did too I've not done too bad recently. The ones that I have done have been making a profit and I think <laughs> I've made like twenty five percent on I'm not I probably put about seventy five quid down. Like we're not talking mega blocks or anything. No, no, no. But yeah. But, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah. So I just. But that was just guesswork. I just thought technology is always thriving. Let's just go with the cheap tech ones. And then a few weeks later, they'd gone up. I was like, oh, <laughs> must know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, we go. There you go. Yeah, so it's not too bad. Um, oh. Oh, I just I'm just ready ready for a holiday now. I'm just ready to get on a plane and go abroad. <laughs> as I'm sure everyone logging in this car will be as well. Yeah, yeah I was reflecting with um, my lady and because uh, last year our, our two big trips were to Brazil and America last year, which are the two mm. most dangerous places in the world you now. <laughs> it's the COVID. It's like, I'm glad we went last year. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it. To be fair, my uh, I, I have a PT and he was in Thailand and it all kicked oh, off. Well, yeah. And yeah, I think he came back after being quarantined for about two weeks. <laughs> crazy stuff uh just give it a couple of minutes uh we've got 14 at the minute so let, let, let some late stragglers who have just probably finishing up some meetings um on that side so that's it when you've got a panel you can have a bit more of a conversation waiting for everybody can't you <laughs> different yeah. opinions and make a start it's okay. It's, okay. It's, it's just our lovely faces that everyone gets to see today <laughs> hence why i made an effort and put a bit of makeup on this one i thought 
Oh yes, I've told you someone. <laughs> yeah, someone today was saying that their their favourite game right now is when they do remote sessions. Is they the first thing is an icebreaker to get everybody to stand up because you know people are very smart from the top upwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've probably been guilty of that in a few team meetings myself. But oh, no. yeah, yeah. He said he has, <laughs> there's a few people who refuse to stand up, so you do wonder what they're wearing or not wearing, but yeah. <laughs> it's weird, because at, at first it was more like I tried to keep as much in a work routine as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But then as we've gone on, I've just thought, do you know what? Why am I bothering putting nice clothes on when I'm just sitting in, in my room on a desk all day yeah, speaking yeah, to people yeah. that I've seen me look 100 times worse <laughs> when I've rolled into work and no meetings um, but yeah so it's a, it's a novelty um, oh interesting I've got a personal question from David uh, so my medals they're from I dance outside, so if you don't know me I dance outside of work personal uh, oh, okay. similar to cheerleading um, it's basically just sort of when I'm feeling a bit less confident, I just put them up on the wall and it just makes me feel uh, <laughs> uh, from that side. But yeah, that's what the follow, David. Uh, yeah, I always get out of meetings. Looking at people's shelves, seeing what books they've got, you know. In the yeah, dog, dog I've got a few birthday cards on there as well because it's my birthday last weekend. So <laughs> um, I was on a meeting with this with my director just before and I had a Febreze bottle at the top of my bookshelf. Okay. And he was like, you're going to remove the Febreze spray, aren't you? And I was like, well, no, but I'm going to now that you've mentioned it. God forbid people think I'm clean. <laughs> well, I got the book there because I mean, behind it is uh, I have a, a, a Patron tequila tin, which is really nice. And I use it to let loose changing. But you know, <laughs> it's, it doesn't come across very well that you've got a bottle of tequila right next to you. So. I have one of them, like a holiday one. Yeah, um, yeah, that. That's going to be changed to a house one So uh, quite recently. So crazy. Um, well, we're at 48 anyway, so okay. let's make a start. Obviously, yeah, it's yeah. five past six. Everyone's been at work all day. Don't want to keep you all uh, still working. Um, but yeah, so obviously, thanks everyone for um, signing in, uh, registering uh, your interest and obviously joining us this evening uh, for this webinar. Um, if it was on the first one, it is slightly different. Um, as, as you can see, you don't have a panel, it's just myself and the lovely Peter Taylor. Um, so basically, he's a keynote speaker within the world of project management, wrote quite a few books, uh, delivered hundreds of webinars and workshops, worked in some major businesses and um, building up global PMO functions. Um, so we we'll just start from the back of some previous feedback, a case study of a leader in action would just be a great addition to our sort of webinar series. I came across Peter on LinkedIn um, from a few of my network comments about his book so it just felt like the right time and a no-brainer um, so the outcome of this webinar is really for you all to sort of have an opportunity and um, to basically ask questions to Peter who you know has a lot of experience in project delivery if you've got an issue Peter's probably are likely dealt with a similar issue in the past so he's on hand to give you advice and um, also give his opinion on what's happening at the moment best practices and everything from that side um, but for those who haven't been on the webinar before and don't know me, um, so I'm Rihanna from Maxwell Bond. Um, I'm a senior recruitment consultant there. I look after sort of the project management and program management side. Currently helping on the product and BA stuff as well at the moment, um, which is why some of you are also on here. Um, Maxwell Bond, we've been roughly established now for about three and a half years. We've been able to build up that good reputation for delivery of top IT talent across the northwest of London. Anything from startups to FTSE, two, FTSE 100, we're just really trying to support our community at the moment. So not just recruitment, but also adding value, which is where the birth of these webinars came from. Um, so just as a little bit of a professional message, just so you're all aware, this webinar is being recorded. It will be distributed on LinkedIn, YouTube, um, especially for those who wish they could have attended but had previous engagements. Um, and then at the end, you will be given like a short survey. Be as honest as you can. This is only my second one as well. So your feedback is greatly appreciated. Helps us with the next one and your ideas is what makes us do more. So please be as honest and as open as you can with them. Um, so it, it's going to be fairly straightforward. Um, Peter's going to introduce himself, give you an idea of what he's been up to. And then basically we're just going to hit the ground running. Some of you have already emailed me your questions 
questions um, but if you do have any other questions about or based on what we're talking about just put it in the chat function or the Q&A function and me and Peter will monitor it and just get as many questions as we can answered. Um, obviously we would normally put the raise of hand so you can vocally ask the questions but there's quite a lot of you on there so to make it a lot easier we've just stuck with the with the Q&A because it seems to have worked in the past. Um, but yeah that's that's pretty much it from me you'll just be hearing me asking the old question here and there um, so throughout the webinar share your thoughts ask the questions and then hopefully we, we should all learn something new um, so I'll hand it over to you Peter to introduce yourself and give yourself a background for anyone that's joined us all right thanks Rihanna. I appreciate it and thanks uh, Michael Vaughan for inviting me to come along this is quite different I mean you're right <laughs> you know I've done I've done a lot of presentations etc um, so my background I mean if you ask me what I am I am a project manager but uh, you know, in the last 15 years, I have spent a mixture of time of helping organizations setting up uh, PMOs, um, transformational management offices as well, uh, significant change inside organizations. Um, you know, I'm a huge guy. I mean, up to you know, 5,000 projects a year with uh, you know, several hundred project managers across the globe uh, for billion dollar companies. So significant scale of that. But at my heart, I'm a project manager, and that's what I've, I've, I've done for most of my career. Um, but these days, I kind of mix between the two. I either, I'm either in a, a full-time job helping an organization, or I'm you know, doing some really interesting interim work, consultancy work, coaching work, and also speaking. I do love to speak at uh, conferences. I used to love to travel. That was nice. See, last year, it was, uh, I think, 15 countries. This year, it's um, one so far. It's a slightly different world we're in right now. Um, but yes, typically on these things, I'm, I've got some slides and I talk to it and we have a discussion at the end. But this one is um, it's just me. and There's nothing else. So I, can't, I can't hide behind slides. Um, so I'm looking forward to the questions. We don't know where it's going to go. Um, but, you know, anything around change, transformation, projects, project managers, project sponsors. Um, uh, even if, you, you know, one of my big things at the moment is if you're not a project manager, actually working with informal project managers, people who deliver change as part of their day job. Yes. It's a big thing I'm talking about at the moment. So uh, yeah, bring it on and, and thank you again for inviting me. Perfect. Well, obviously, thanks for taking the time. For anyone who doesn't, who hasn't been seeing Peter on LinkedIn, he's been doing God knows how many webinars a day uh, and workshops. So appreciate the time to speak. So this is your perfect opportunity, everyone, to get some questions answered from you know a real leader in the market. Um, so I guess first things first, let's just start it quite broad. So you've you've done a new book and you wrote that in 21 days. I guess, what was the reason behind it? What made you want to write this book? Uh, yeah, so there's kind of two things. One was, um, you know, when this whole situation, you know, this world crisis hit, what do you do? And, um, you know, there is, you know, like many people in, in, in my market and other markets as well, it's like, well, you kind of give stuff back and you start doing uh, presentations and sharing information. Um, but I thought, well, I, could, I mean, that was good and I enjoyed it and I've done quite a few, but you know, what can we get, there's always a positive out of these things, and what concrete thing can we produce from this? And I came up with the idea one weekend of, um, to create a book. Now, you know, I've written 19 books so far. Uh, I, they're a mixture of traditional published through um, various publishing companies, and I've also self-published. I know how relatively simple that is to do. So I came up with this idea of um, a book, <clears throat> You're very kind. You said I wrote the book. I really didn't. I think I wrote, you know, about a thousand words actually, which is the intro and the end. Uh, the rest of it was written by um, project managers around the world. So it's simple. I went on LinkedIn. I said, look, I come up with this idea. Twenty-one days. We will write a book, edit a book, design a book, um, put it all together, and get it published. And I had a storm of interest at uh, this point. Um, you know, thousands of views of the LinkedIn article, uh, eventually got a whole list of people who said, yes, they would like to do it. I gave them a very tight timeline, no chance of uh, being late. You know, you were either made the deadline or you didn't in submission. And at the end of it, 56 people submitted a 500 word um, submission to the book, which was broken down into, you know, it was, it was, it was called the projectless manager and it was supposed to be about this current situation and how people dealt with it. So some of it is a, we call lockdown genius. So these are, I think, really neat ideas that people have done to keep uh, the team spirit going, to keep the projects moving, to keep the change flowing. Um, then there was uh, kind of a, a, a chapter all about sort of legacy inspiration. So ideas that trigger something that really will be valuable in, in the new future, in the new 
world as it, as it emerges from this and some wild cards there's always some stuff you can't categorize <laughs> so we put it together um and we got it done and i even got um children of project managers to submit um drawings for the cover so there is a fantastic cover of uh, a super lady who's a project manager or someone who's very proud of their mum. Uh, <laughs> everything with the cape and the boots, etc. It's it's great. And we yeah, have got it done. And there's some some great ideas in there. And and I, you know, I really I just I just coordinated it and I assembled it and I put it through the Amazon Kindle uh, publishing process, which is kind of easy to do. <laughs> and hey, presto, it's out there in Amazon uh, in Kindle and printed format around the world, and we're delighted. And yeah, we were, yeah, it's just, yeah, it was a fun thing to do that had value and, and got people engaged and, and prove what collectively people can do. Yeah, and obviously that's, that's important, especially in the crisis that we're in at the moment. Uh, it's unprecedented, you know, it's a global thing. It's not just us here that's being affected by it. You mentioned there that there was really good ideas. Uh, you probably, you were surprised if you say you can't answer it, but I guess what would you say is, was the most interesting, you know, out of the box thinking point that you got from one of the writers uh, that you thought actually i've never thought of doing anything like that um, um do anything yeah, like that that, that, you is, that is a hard one to answer because they're all different i mean I, what the big thing i got out of it was the uh the optimism and forward thinking of the group of people that, that so much submitted things i mean they're all describing different aspects of the challenges that, that, that we've got here right now and i think the strongest ones were around how important it is right now to maintain team spirit and team bonding and actually um you know one of the one of the ones is around almost relaunching that that process and it's something I'm, I'm doing with a couple of companies right now actually um you know i have some uh workshops you know one of them is the project from hell which has got kind of a real fun exercise of time being involved it's, it's good fun and it's, it's strong gamification but I'm working with a couple of companies right now because they know that you know people have people are connected through these sort of technology, but they've kind of lost a little bit about that kind of team connection. And when you know when they come back into the work, which is going to happen over the next two three months, they want the team to be working effectively. So we've kind of been working on uh, you know if you like rebonding or relaunching that team spirit. And I, and I think that was something I hadn't actually thought about until I saw the submission from someone saying this is really important. You kind of think. Well, we are a great team before this, but uh, so therefore it'll be three months' time. We're going to be a great team again. Well, actually, you know that whole you know storming or forming, storming, um, you know, norming, performing type process you go through. You kind of have to restart that. So yeah, I think that's my favourite one. But there's just a great spirit from the people who contributed. Yeah, and to have obviously people from 21 countries, it uh, it seems that project management, you know, it, it's the, it's ultimately the same, isn't it? In you know whatever country, but it's the ideas and outside of the box that makes it different um i guess where did the idea of the projectless manager come from i guess what was the influence well the inspiration behind that as a title as a thought as yeah a it's yeah it was, it's something i'm sure you as an organization recognize i mean it's just I, mean, I have a lot of people i have a lot of connections on linkedin you know so i'm connected to nearly thirty thousand people on linkedin and um, you know i'm more than happy to make that thirty one thousand after this call but um <laughs> send me the invitation i'll accept it but i i instantly saw so many people coming up going you know it's it's over i'm you know i'm now out the market i don't have i don't have a project and uh, this concept of the projectless manager just came to my mind so that's where the, the title came with so many people who are you know uh were just were furloughed or, or released to let go or their contracts weren't being renewed or you know all of that as i'm sure you, you guys in metropolitan know, know all, all too well um and so I thought, you know, well, that's a state, the projectless manager. So what can we do about it? And, you know, what can we do as a, as a community? And, you know, the book, the book idea came out. And, and yeah, it seems, you know, people really liked it. I mean, even the ones who didn't quite make the deadlines and even those ones who just, you know, thought it was a good idea have been incredibly supportive. And, uh, you know, we keep, uh, keep promoting it out there. That's it. You know, it's the, the idea of a community, isn't it? And you all helping each other you know, through this hard time. Because I think a lot of people agree projects, you know, has been hardly impacted massively um, in certain, especially certain businesses and certain industries. So um, there's no time like the present to, to do that uh, and make that add that value. Um, well, that you, makes don't, nice. you don't have to spend two years writing a book. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm doing a master's at the moment and trying to find time just to write a 2000 word essay is impossible. So how you did it in 21 days 
I do hold my hat off to you. Um, but I, one of the questions that has come through uh, sort of links to that um, in terms of what you mean by a lot of people being furloughed and out of work. Um, so a lot of businesses at the moment are, tend to, when they are recruiting for project managers, do look for specific technologies to be implemented. So they want that experience rather than a generalist PM who can just be very good at delivering projects. Um, so Bascar just wants to know, wants to sort of understand the rationale behind it. And, you know, what do you think about that sort of hiring mentality? And, and if you agree with that. Yeah, I think it takes a higher mentality of the situation. You know, if I was looking to build a project management team, for our generic project delivery, I'm not too sure I'd be worried about what technical technology has been used in the past, etc. As long as, they, as long as they generally understood the industries that they were working in, and I think there are certain industries you just have to have specialist yeah. knowledge. But generally speaking, project management, as you said, is project management. But I think, and I fear, in this current market, if they're looking, you know, if they're looking for very specific project manager to deliver a very specific technology, for example, and implement the, and lead the implementation of it. If the market is awash with so many kind of candidates out there, then they can be incredibly specific on, on what their needs are, mm. which is very unfortunate. And unfortunately, it also means they probably won't get the best project manager necessarily, but they get the one that has the CV or resume that has the right words on it. Um, the right boxes that ticks, or they've gone through the, uh, the the auto filter that so many companies use these days to you know, sort out their, their CVs that are submitted. And I think that's a real shame. And I think it's you know it's one of the things that um, you know I think if you're blind submit, you know, if you're blind gathering applicants, you know if you're using LinkedIn or stuff like that, and they're, they're good platforms to do it. But you know I think you miss out. That's why you know a great recruitment uh, advisor can be really helpful in this situation because if they know the candidate even if you haven't got you know 10 out of 10 of the skills that are required but you know this candidate is a really good person and will adapt quickly then they can actually champion their case so i think it's inevitable to, to get back to your answer i think it's an inevitable of the market as it as it will be for a while um i'm not sure it's the best thing and certainly if i was building a general project management team i wouldn't go that route so I guess on the flip side, because we do have quite a few hiring managers on the webinar today, uh, I guess those, you know, for them, if they are looking to go down the specialist route, what would you be advice when recruiting for a project manager? You know, what should they actually be taking into consideration and looking at at the moment with the market, with the way it is? Yeah, I think a lot of it comes from, you know, what, what you can look up an individual and you can see what their, their you know, recommendations are. You know, how many people say they do great work? You know, what is their network like? What is their community like? Is their experience? I mean, and yes, you can look at certifications, but I'll be honest, you know, it's not that difficult to get certified um these days you can go for crash courses and etc so i think you know you're looking for for personality and at the end of the day you know the best is always going to be that someone has referred you in um because they know you <laughs> so uh, yeah. yeah i'm sorry that bypasses you guys i know but of course in the past you know and i'm you know like, as i say you know, i'm in i'm in you know i'm in the you know, i'm in the market for a job Job. If someone's got a great job out there, um, a PMO or transformation to be set up on, I'd be more than happy. I would, because I want to stay relevant. That's the reason I'm interested yeah. in it in my next job. I, you know, I'm not retired, or I don't, I've, you know, I don't intend to just speak only speak and write books for the rest of my life. But you know, I worked in the past with a recruitment advisor, and they knew me very well. We we moved across you know, two or three companies together, and it was a great journey because they they really knew me and they could really talk to. Um, you know, prospective employers for me and, and articulate my skills and my style and make sure it's fitted. So, you know, that's, that's a great thing. Yeah, no, definitely. I guess obviously taking taking it back to the books that you've written so 19 books that's you know impressive <laughs> um you know for anybody i guess out of all the books that you've written i guess what's the biggest lesson that you've learned when you've wrote all these books you know when it comes to project management and you know that could be a bit of advice for everybody um yes i'm gonna, I'm gonna well i'm gonna i'm gonna go all the way back to the lazy project manager and then we definitely are gonna come to that sponsorship question because it's a it's a huge thing for me i'm really yeah. sponsorship right now. <laughs> for me no you know the, the biggest selling book the oldest you know, the original book i wrote uh, just over 10 years ago is called the lazy project manager and it really is a summation of all the things i learned up to that point about project management it's a book 
that you know insult your industry and get on in life really going yeah lazy project manager is a, is a is a strange juxtaposition of statement but at the heart i i learned through my own experience to effect you know work effectively and efficiently it's about working smarter not harder you know progress isn't made by um wise men it's made by lazy men there's a quote uh, from robert highland science fiction writer it's made by lazy men uh, finding easier ways to do something and that's where the efficiency comes from so the lazy project manager is is by far the sort of most influential book for me it launched um, everything i've done it's allowed me to to write all the other books it's allowed me to travel to over 25 countries and speak at nearly 400 events conferences and webinars etc it's, it's it at its heart it's just a series of stories it goes through the project life cycle from start to finish and everywhere there is a lesson i've learned uh, a very odd and the reason people tell me the project the, the book is so popular is because one it's short two it's funny because it's got dinosaurs and field marshals <laughs> and, and, and Disney, <laughs> things like that um but mostly it's about the fact that the that there's a there's a very honest personal case study at the end of every chapter where i completely screwed something up and, but learned an important lesson and and at the point of writing the book i don't think there are any other books in project management that were tomes of perfection and you think nobody ever made a mistake um so yeah i think there's i think there's still a lot and the book still sells you know uh, it's one of the best in project management books ever it still sells well and it's still got a lot of lessons in it and it's not a second edition so i have updated it but you know at, at the heart i think that's 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 the big one for me no plug-in at all there by the way guys um, <laughs> best is sell i'm only joking you need to read it if you haven't read it um but, 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 <laughs> come on um but yeah so obviously um a question from alan whiteside yeah. so he's asked could you suggest any training in response to poor project sponsorship in experience within an organization okay yes and i can talk for hours on this one in fact i get a two-hour uh, workshop on it last uh, yesterday actually uh, so but very quickly I, there is another book about sponsorship very quickly i did some survey of a uh, large number of companies about what they thought about project sponsorship and, and simply put project sponsorship right now could be um put to you know you can do, you can describe it in three numbers 85 83 and 100 and if you know those three numbers you know everything about project sponsorship right now around the world we asked uh, for the research for the book, uh, a large number of organizations, different industries, different geographies, do you have project sponsors? And 85% of them said, yes, we have project sponsors. Now they ran projects, they ran change, so you worry about the 15% who didn't seem to recognize the concept of project sponsor, but 85%, not bad, could be improved. We then said, what do you do to support, train, develop, mentor, guide, help your project sponsors? And 83% of those companies said absolutely nothing. We just expect them to be able to do the job. And the final question, the other hundred was, we asked them, do you think it's important to have a project sponsor? And everybody, 100%, well, it's 99.5% actually, said, yes, it's important to have a project sponsor. And that's the state of project sponsorship. See, everybody thinks it's important. Most people have got one. Nobody does anything to help the project sponsor. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know, if you, if you want, I'm happy to, if you want to reach out to me, I'm happy to share some, some information on this. I mean, the approach I found that works best is very open um, discussions with the project sponsors inside an organization about the value of project sponsorship, not how bad it may or may not be inside the organization. Don't ever get personal. Then you move into a, a parallel activity of working with project managers to fill the gap because you're not going to instantly get great project sponsors. So teach your project managers how to work effectively with the sponsors they've got. But at the sponsor level, I operate and deliver kind of coaching on a one-to-one -one basis with sponsors to allow them to solely evolve and let be honest it's not their fault they are successful people who have achieved a certain level in the side of the organization um, and they're good at everything else but they may or may not have a project background and they may or may not understand what a project sponsors should do so it's not really their fault and they're not given the time or support to develop so sponsorship for me is a huge challenge i think it's the biggest challenge in project management right now they'd love to Talk more about it and i'm happy to <clears throat> if anybody wants to contact me then i'm happy to share a lot more information on that yeah and if it's definitely is something that a lot of you guys do want let me know and we can you know we can do another webinar just on that uh, in a lot more detail um but but I, you mentioned there about training the project managers um i guess how for, for you know for those that are leaders and coaching and mentoring the more junior ones coming up what advice would you give to them to 
you know, to overcome that and, and yeah, be better with Yeah, I, mean, <clears throat> I think they need, you know, it's like anybody when they're, when they're starting out. I mean, I, you know, I was, I'm from the generation of the accidental project manager. I was just became a project manager and they would call me that. I was just, you know, I discovered I was doing projects many years after I started. It was, but there was no help. Um, whereas these days, you know, what you wanted to do is you want to kind of create a, a safe environment to help project managers develop. And that, you know, that's one of the great things a PMO can do, for example, is to be that kind of supportive mechanism for project managers, a voice to, for them to go to. You know, you can set up like a buddy system inside an organization, you know, experienced project manager, working with a more junior project manager just to be there to give them advice, answer questions, help them when they're stressed. Or again, you know, uh, I work with a couple of organizations where they use me for remote coaching. It's just helping a project manager. So, you know, when they have a challenge, they can contact me. We can set up a session for half an hour or so and just talk it through. And I think as long as you've got some sort of system where project managers, if they, or any level of project manager, really, they don't, they don't, they're not isolated and they're not, they don't feel they don't have any support. They've got someone they can go to who's a you know a safe uh, pair of ears, if you like, to listen to them, to give them some advice, to put them back on the track, not make them feel lonely or isolated. That's a really good thing. So any organization, I think, should if you have a community of project managers, how can you make that happen? How can you help your project managers support each other and, and become more effective? Yeah, no, definitely. I think, <laughs> well, this is probably uh, more something from my experience of working with so many um you know, different sort of clients. So it's interesting to see that some businesses have dedicated PMOs um, yeah. from that perspective, but then some businesses don't. Obviously, as someone as yourself who's built up PMOs, you know, what, what what's your opinion on that? Do you think there's a successful way to build as a PMO or where do you sort of sit within that? What do you think? Um, again, it does depend on the company <clears throat> and what their need is. And it can be everything. I mean, a PMO, again, this is a huge topic as well. But I mean, you know, a PMO can be supportive, controlling or directive, or it can be a mixture of blended of, of all of those sort of things. <clears throat> you know, if a PMO is just supportive, it's really, it's almost like a, uh, a supporting mechanism, almost as a kind of help desk for project managers. And that, the PMO can be one person who's an experienced project manager who has some time available to help their colleagues. But it, as you can become controlling or even directive, like directly owning the project, so you, then you need more and more of a, structured organization but pmo is just i mean P, what does pmo even stand for you know, you know <laughs> projects programs portfolio um you know projects mostly over budget that's the great joke about pmos they see it's pretty much a sense of humor um my, my favorite one actually was uh, i was working with a guy from the north and uh, well, i was working at a, a workshop in the north of england and uh, as you know you know, you know the, Northern people are very straight when it comes to comment, look at what they think. And, uh, I, you know, I, I said, my only thing in this workshop was, you know, what does PMO stand for? And I'm so used to people saying projects and programs and portfolio. And this guy stood up and said, I'll tell you what, it stands for pisses me off. That's what it stands for. <laughs> and being put under a PMO for the first time, that PMO was a bad PMO. It was only about, um, you know, project policing, discipline, control, checklists, etc. And I don't blame him. I would have been pissed off as well. So, you know, I think the right PMO with the right leader and the right team can be incredibly effective in most organizations. That's, that's my view anyway. But the PMO has to be relevant. It has to constantly change and evolve. It has to be up to date and it cannot be the project police. And it's got to be the right sort of project firefighting. It's not, you know, it's about preventing fires rather than putting them out. And, and every PMO has got to be unique, I think, as well. You know, to yeah. be, what does that business need right now? And what does it need tomorrow and the day after? And where you see PMOs disappearing, it's usually where the PMO has not evolved in line with the business and the strategy and all of that. Yeah, and that's interesting because some, uh, I know a lot of big businesses at the minute are trying to redesign that uh, yeah. and trying to do that change aspect to it, um, which I think provides exciting opportunities as well. Um, yeah. So we've got a question here from um, Andrew Brown. He's, he's asked, in recent years, we've seen Agile come to the forefront with product owners and Scrum Master roles taking the lead on team delivery. How do you see a project management role having changed due to this new construct? Oh, I knew we'd get the A word at some point. <laughs> it had to come in. <laughs> you know, the Agile is not a project management methodology. Agile is an approach to product development and the rest of it. And I, you know, most of the companies I've worked in, we've, you know, our methodology when it comes to projects, and I've worked for software companies for most, uh, yeah, most of the time uh, that I've led PMOs, and most of our methodologies are uh, just a mixture. I mean, you know, 
it's it's a mixture between uh, agile it's a mixture, and lean and uh, you know contractually sometimes there's also kind of gated or milestones etc. I mean we even joked in my last organisation I worked in we came up with the term gladjar which is a gated lean agile approach. <laughs> And it, what it meant was there was there's still a role for the project manager. The project manager is looking at the life cycle from the start of the project to the end of the project. And throughout that, there are agile iterations and agile activities. And I, and I totally support those. And you know, if you're if you're in software de development, it's a different world. And, you know, but my world very much was about software deployment and implementation into clients and, and so forth. And so you know, we use the good components of Agile. We use the um, the benefits and the profits that you can see from having that very fast moving and you know, fast decision making, iterative type of approach. It's, it's all good stuff. Um, so I don't think they. I don't think they. Um, you know, it's either one or the other. And I don't think there's not a place for project managers in in the Agile world. Um, but there's a lot of there's a lot of confusion out there. Definitely. And, and to be fair, the first webinar that we did was surrounding sort of agile and, and project delivery. And that's the interesting thing I think with some businesses is actually seeing how some adopt it, how some, you know, I've even seen a company moving away from agile and back into purely waterfall delivery. So yeah, it's, it's interesting how everyone's, you know, different opinions on that yeah. um, from, from that perspective. Um, so Christophe has asked a question. He's asked, I'm seeing a lot of la a large number of people claiming to be senior project managers. In your opinion, what actually makes someone a senior PM? Is it time in the role, size of projects, uh, companies work for, etc., or is it a combination of them all? All right. It depends <laughs> is the answer. Now, uh, a number of companies I've got into, being a senior project manager meant that you've been there a long time and you've been promoted to senior project manager because it gave you a pay rise and you didn't get that project manager. And that's the brutal truth of some companies. But reality is, and what I've, you know, I've always tried to do is to put in place something that really quantified that step up from project manager to senior project manager. And it was a mixture of experience, a mixture of scale, a mixture of risk. You know, we put all those sort of things together. Um, and we also build in the fact that you know, um, you know, it had to be a mixture of uh, uh, internal and external qualifications, uh, and also senior project managers had a, a community responsibility. I was talking earlier on about the, you know, the buddy system. Yeah. If you're a senior PM, you should be capable of budding up a couple of other project managers who are, who are more junior to you. So I think all of the, you know, you need to put all that together into the job definition. But at the end of the day, you know, you're as good as your last project in many cases. You know, you really, uh, and that's a tough thing, but you know, you're, you're not fixed at a level. I mean, I know within most companies and most hierarchies and most HR systems, et cetera, you will be fixed. But the reality is that I've always, you know, put in place mechanisms to assess project managers based on their current project. And it doesn't mean they're gonna get demoted or promoted or et cetera, but you've got that constant validation of how are they doing and are they still learning? etc so i think it's a very rounded statement and it will be different in each organization but you know i joined one and i won't say who it is but you know when i joined out of the hundred or so project managers i had um something like 70 percent were senior and they really weren't uh, because you know less than 20 percent of them ever have any formal training project management and five less than five percent had any formal external qualification in project management they had truly been made senior because one, um, they hadn't screwed something up in the past. And they used a naughty word there, but they nearly got something really badly wrong. Um, and they, they hadn't done that. And secondly, they were due to pay rise. It was the only way they could get a pay rise, so let's make them senior project manager. The ratio was completely wrong. And it took a lot, it takes an amazing amount of work to, to resolve that situation. It, it really does. Yeah. And, and obviously, you know, from a recruitment in the project management world, you know, that's, I see that all the time. Uh, another one that I see is, which a lot of people probably agree with me, is in rid of job titles like program manager and portfolio. Some businesses have project managers and then senior project managers. Now a senior project manager is more of a program manager. Um, so it's interesting how those job titles are blurring. It's I don't know whether companies just can't be bothered having so many different job titles. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, what, you know, program manager, what do you mean a program manager? I mean, you know, Again, you know, program can be a true program, mm. bringing some sort of coherent change to an organization, or it could be the fact you're just deploying something across 20 sites 
sites around the world, and that's seen as a program because the project manager at each site. So therefore, you're, over, you're overseeing a replication and duplication of activity. Every organisation is difficult, different in this. Yeah. It's, um, it's it's really really quite hard to have a, a standardised view on it, and, it, and you do need to put some effort in. I think as a you know, if you're a PMO leader, you need to put some real effort into this. Mm. Don't have too many graphs. I mean, that's the first thing. Don't have. I mean, I'm trying one company now. It's seven levels. Oh, wow. What does that mean? <laughs> seven levels. Yeah. Yeah, project manager communicates well. Yeah, senior project manager communicates really well. Program manager communicates really really well. I mean, yeah, it makes <laughs> nonsense. And uh, we we brought it down to three, and we just had basically. Uh, project controller, project manager, and senior project manager. Um, and, you know, we scaled it that way. Yeah, that, to be fair, that's what I'm seeing in quite a few, especially those that are reorganising their PMOs. That's yeah. the road they seem to go down. Um, but da Danielle's asked a question, which is quite similar on the similar route with sort of job titles and job responsibility. Um, she's basically said, hi, Peter. Uh, what are your thoughts on hybrid BA PM roles? Too much in one or dependent on the scale of the project or size of the organization oh interesting one now if you want to have a great argument with people you can say a ba a pm or a project sponsor you can have two out of three which one you're going to have <laughs> a great way of starting an argument in in what you remember pubs when we used to have those yes, <laughs> the what, those? <laughs> whatever um can you combine the two roles you can in i think in pretty uh, small scale changes um, I think if it gets at all significant in the scale and risk of what's going on, then you need that objectivity. It's like saying, can you have project manager, project sponsor combined? Well, only for a very small project. Reality is, you need that that partnership to bring about the. You know, it's it's like in a band when they really get on, but there's there's some tension there that really it's what makes them so good. <laughs> Yeah. What breaks them eventually? You kind of need that in a project. You know, a, gr a great project. If you've got a BA and a PM and a project sponsor all working together, you know, challenging each other, then brilliant. That's that's fantastic. But I think it's very limited to actually doing both, and it's very difficult to bounce between the two roles. You know, today I'm a BA, yeah. tomorrow I'm a project manager, or this afternoon I'm a project manager. I think it's very difficult. Yeah, and, and to be fair, we, we've had a few people who recruit for that stuff and nine times out of ten, they normally, by the end of the process, change their mind and just want one or the other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and another one we're seeing in hybrid is a lot of product slash BAs uh, as well. So that's a new yeah. sort of hybrid coming up. Um, obviously, I know you're a project manager, but what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, I think anything, I mean, anything that's hybrid, is, it is challenging in, in, yeah. in, in any level of scale. It's like, you know, project manager, BA, solution architect, you know, all of those sort of things. When you get to a certain level of scale, you need all of those to do the job they're supposed to be doing. Because, you know, if they're not doing, you know, the, the, that part of the job perfectly well, you know, because they're concentrating on something else, it, you know, you're going to have problems and difficulties. And, you know, hybrid I kind of get, but high, if you're doing hybrid for the fact that it seems to be cheaper, I think you're being, you know, I think you're being a bit cheap and mean and trying to make <laughs> money. And it will cost you eventually, I believe. Yeah, and I think that's it down the line. Eventually, you are going to need one, you know, each of one with one specific, especially as yeah. you're getting bigger and objects are getting bigger. Um, so a question from Nathan, a little bit of a different role. He said, he's asked, how do you think the role of change management has evolved and um, the way project managers and teams think about the end user and the sustainability of change? Great question. <laughs> it is a great question. And I think it's, um, it's a sad lack in many organisations, you know, typically, and, you know, it, perhaps in my world, because I mean, most of my projects have been like customer facing. So it's a, mm -hmm. and the supplier delivering technology and project management as consultative services to a, to a client. You know, it, I always see that change management is, is kind of forgotten. I think it's one of the things, if you have a PMO, I think one of the responsibilities of the PMO is to educate project managers in basic principles of organizational change management. So they at least understand it. They at least are aware when it's not being done properly. Because most customers go, yeah, we handle that. And then you see this huge void. They don't handle it at all. Um, uh, the, the problem is that often, and you know, bearing in mind, you know, one of my background experiences is working for KPMG. So I'm, you know, I'm about to slag off the big boys in some to a degree. The problem is when you get into, <laughs> if you get into it, then suddenly you, you know, you've got, you know, you've suddenly got a, you know, a million euro plus bill coming at you as an organisation for for change management. 
And that scares people because, you know, suddenly the, the original project budget has doubled or trebled or whatever. And so, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's just like, well, we'll be fine. Yeah, we can handle change. And actually, most companies can't handle change. But most companies these days should be should have that embedded inside their own organization because this is the, you know, we're in the world of business. Yeah. Policy. We're in the world of constant change. And it really change should be at the heart of a culture of an organization. But I'm, I don't see it being done particularly well in too many places. Sometimes, yeah, that's absolutely. But again, I think, you know, project managers should, you know, a good project manager and certainly a senior project manager should certainly educate themselves in the basic principles of organizational change management so they can be aware of of the consequences of it and what should be doing and be aware of when it isn't being done i, I guess for any project managers and, and senior pms who want to you know get better at organizational change and management what sort of training or you know method you know any what sort of recommendations would you make for them to be more aware of stuff like that and well, is it just not awareness really is fairly simple i mean because there's there's a number of good books out there and i can't remember any of the titles immediately off, off the top of my head of course and there are a number of you know standards in, in change management i think any of those will what it will do if you read up about it is it will just break your thought processes down to understand oh this needs to be done then this needs to be done this needs to be reinforced you know in, and the fact that change just doesn't if you think about it as an individual you know you don't instantly change at all you know you are persuaded to change or the need for change is so great you can commit to it um, and I'm grumpy as you go through the change process and it has to be reinforced and it has to be proven and embedded and invalidated and eventually you look back and go oh yeah that was change we, you know it was okay oh here comes the next change and that's, it that's bad. You know, we, humans just don't like change that much yeah and yet we're in a world of constant change and maybe you know maybe one of the good things that's come out of the recent uh, experience that we're in is the fact that people are more open-minded and organizations are i feel organizations are truly taking on board the need to accelerate change and i you know i honestly hope tough as the market is out there at the moment i honestly believe and hope that because of that change of attitude that organizations truly need to transform and particularly around digital transformation that actually there will be some great opportunities out there for people uh, in our world to do some great work and do it at a speed much faster than it would have been done had you know the COVID thing not happened. I couldn't agree more and I think this has allowed businesses to change as well it's the yeah. perfect opportunity to make changes um, and you've obviously you've had no choice <laughs> either businesses have had to. Um, One of my favourite dark humour jokes I saw come out there and I expect people have seen you know there's a cartoon that says you know who is the what, what was the biggest accelerator to digital transformation CEO, CFO, CIO, CTO or COVID-19? The answer is COVID-19 obviously it's forced the issue it's forced the attention to me it had to happen quickly. Yes Alan Whiteside has just put a comment in saying uh, that he thinks that change management is particularly needed in the movement towards that agile organization is that something that you agree with as well or do you I do and I, you know they actually the, the current book i'm working on is a book <laughs> this is agility and it's all about that it's all about you know to, for organizations to be effective in, in, in you know moving and keeping pace with the market is they have to have real leadership at the highest level they have to connect that leadership to great sponsorship they have to drive that through to a community of project managers and non-project managers people who do change as part of their day-to-day -day job who are supported in skills who are capable of forming teams on a regular basis to deliver uh, kind of the project-based economy that's out there and who have an underlying culture of uh, change and agility and all of that so effectively it's not the fact that we you know we're going to change from september to december then we're going to stop no you know we're going to change we're going to keep changing and tomorrow we change and the day after we change and, and that is just a constant process and and you know a lot of companies are going to have to really unlearn their their history and the way they've worked and relearn the new way of working and that's a, that's a great challenge for some companies i feel yeah Definitely. Um, so again, from on white side, he's asked, how might we ensure that lessons learned or even lessons learning from experience are acted upon rather than ending up as lessons recorded to then sit in a drawer and gather? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <See that. laughs> well, my favourite things I do when I'm doing workshops is, you know, if you've got a whiteboard, I go and find a, a, a pen that doesn't work. And, uh, <laughs> 
you know, I, I make the point, I try and write on the whiteboard and I'll put it back down like everybody else does and I'll pick up a different pen and then later on I'll pick up the, 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 the pen that's run out again and try and write with it a second time. And I make the, the you know, the, the comparison that, you know, somehow we've evolved the life form to the point we are, the successes we have, you know, space travel, technology, whatever it may be, you know, construction genius around the world. Um, and somehow we also don't seem to have ever learned how to replace, throw a, a used pen in the bin or something like that. Um, this is the contradiction, I think. Um, yeah, my tips on that, and I've been asked to, to look at you know, knowledge management systems and stuff, and they're really difficult, particularly with global companies. You know, what, do you, you know, what is good practice? What is acceptable practice around the world? You've got language challenges, difficulties, constantly technology and everything else is moving. Uh, you know, my one tip is, uh, you know, limit it. You know, share the lessons at the end of the project, absolutely. But if you can just get one or two things from that that is shared and learned and, and really driven to the rest of the project community. The, the problem is that, you know, if you walk away from the lessons learned thing at the end of a project with, you know, 28 lessons you've learned, you can't share that with everybody. It's just too much, too much information. One company I work for, you know, they, they, they cracked it. They, the one thing they wanted to learn and be shared at the end of the project was, what issue did you encounter that you did not expect? I wouldn't tell us about the surprises and what you did about them. And that was, they put into a little database that was effectively then fed their risk management assessment at the start of the next project. You can profile the project, you know, it was a similar sort of project, similar sort of environment, whatever. And they can look at the, the, you know, the, the lessons that truly have been learned from other project managers and they could act upon it. But all, that's all we asked, that's all that organization asked, is just do that one thing and the rest of it which is keep within the project team. And it's better to just share effectively one thing than it is to ineffectively share a hundred. Yeah. Um, so Peter, Peter Jones has then asked with most, well, back to the whole pandemic, uh, he's asked yeah. with most companies' plans and budgets being thrown into disarray as a result of the pandemic, what are the key interventions, different approaches that we should think about in scoping and initiating new projects? Yes, that's a, that's a good question, as uh, all people say when they're trying to think of a good answer to the good question. Um, I think a couple of things. I think people should really think harder about the projects they commission and approve. And, and sometimes when things are really good and life is good and business is good and profits are good, that, that, that isn't done as rigorously as possible. But I think more than that, it's a matter of projecting ahead. What truly, really, what are the benefits going to come from this? And it's you know, you know, it's it can't be benefits in three, four years time anymore. I mean, okay, there's some strategic intentions at that level inside organisations, but generally speaking, you know, projects should deliver much faster these days, or they should be broken down into benefits realisation in a much shorter period of time. So I think they're the questions that you would ask of an organisation: is if you're going to approve this project, and the business case says that you're going to get your money back in three years time. Really? I mean, is that something that is, that is really going to work in these modern world? Who knows what three years looks like? I mean, we, you know, we start this year, we didn't know what May or June looked like, for goodness sake. So on that basis, they challenge a lot more and, and, and reduce the time span of the kind of projects we're talking about. Now, I'm, you know, I'm not talking about some mega construction build that's going to take two years and stuff like that. I'm talking about your, your, your general run-of-the-mill typical uh, projects that take place inside organizations uh, for technology level or a growth or a strategy you know, that kind of stuff yeah um so to stick with um the current situation so um someone asked have the events of the last few months presented any new challenges for project managers e.g remote working now becoming the new norm communication approach and style urgency as some organizations ramp up to recover for lost time yeah um for most part i think project managers are pretty good at communicating and pretty good at re, you know remote and physical uh, communication i think you need some real physical presence um so i'm going to reflect back so when i worked for siemens it was during a period of time when we had the last recession and like many companies the first thing we did was stop travel um shut the expenses down stop training and eventually you know, like many companies we lost a few people as well but we we're able through the PMO, we were able to look at the effectiveness of our project managers and project teams as a result of that. And we saw a significant dip in the ability to build a project team and effectively communicate and connect that team and, and create that spirit of you know, performance because there was no physical contact. So I think you know, remote 
working is definitely is not a not a problem for project managers throughout the project life cycle but it's a challenge i think at the early start of a project if you don't have some sort of physical connection with people or something you know it takes more effort so i think project managers have to put more effort if we if really you know your world is good you know you're starting projects in this virtual way you're in and as far as you're concerned that's the way the project is going to be run it can be done but i think it takes a lot more effort and you have to be a lot more creative in your approaches to engage the project team you know we all suffer from you know Zoom fatigue or any other products fatigue or whatever, <laughs> uh, you do it too much, and and you kind of need that, and, it, and the project manager's got to think about that. And again, I think as far as the ramping up is concerned, yeah, it's going to be challenging. But again, I think you know this is where organisations need to really think about the use of their the project managers and their project management community and optimise it and see the opportunity. And and you know again, you know don't don't be don't be don't be mean in this area. Get the right people in and. You will see the benefits. You know, yeah. you know, project managers can deliver phenomenal things inside organisations if they're allowed to do that, and they're not they're not too stressed with too many projects or all the rest of it. So I think, you know, again, I, I do believe there's positive things that come out of this, and I do believe that the you know, the projects are going to be critical moving forward. I do believe the market's going to drive the need, and and I hope companies don't you know burn out the project managers they got if because they haven't got enough of them. Yeah. Um, so that leads on to it nicely um, to a question about the current situation, but not from a project management perspective. Um, so uh, someone wants to know, do you think the current approach by the UK and other governments to tackle COVID undermines the idea that a structured approach to problem solving is the right approach? Ooh, that's a big one. Thank you for that one, Rima. It was a very interesting <laughs> question at the beginning, didn't I? <laughs> You know what, I think, um, you know, what this has shown is that, you know, despite a general framework of plan that, you know, the world had for something like this, they really were very unprepared in many ways. And most governments have attempted to deal with it as best they could, but they were doing it on the fly, on the move. I think it's a great example of the fact that, you know, the, the better you plan, the better you prepared you are, the better you can, you can deal with something. Um, and I think there'll be a lot of reflection and lessons learned after this. And of course, we know certain countries are dealing it in a very different way to other countries, and we have no idea. This is so big. You know, I know, for example, I was very interested in Sweden in the early days about you know what what their approach was because they they looked at the economy as important as it, they did people's health. Now, what would be the outcome of that? I, you know, I think. And I, and I also reflected because I watched the Bill Gates video from a few years back about, you know, we, we need to be prepared for this because it's going to happen. Because you know, <laughs> we're everywhere as a world. I think, it, you know, what can I say? Uh, it, it demonstrates the world is so connected and so disconnected. It shows that, you know, there's, you, you know, there's, there's a concept of a plan and there's the realities of a plan and there's the proof of a plan that it's actually going to work. Um, and this, you know, when it, when, when people are involved and it's the, you know, the lives of people involved, it becomes so serious that, that it's, it's, I don't know, it's really difficult to, to, to say what the, perf the perfect answer is. And it's probably something we're only going to learn in, in true hindsight in many years to come, I think. But, you know, I think governments have done what governments have done and, and people have done what they've done. And, you know, I think out of it has come some, some really interesting spirit. I mean, if I have to latch on anything positive from this, I've got to know more of my neighbours in the last <laughs> three months than I, than I did when I was working hard and, and travelling. It's That's not just that, it's how much skills you've learned from decorating, your garden, yeah, yeah. I don't think anyone's houses have looked nicer, clean. Oh, clean, all that sort of stuff. I don't, know, I don't know if that's it. I, I really an answer to the question. That's a big, difficult one. I'm, I'm just <laughs> it did say, uh, I think it came from David because he's put in apologies for the tough one, but thanks for trying. <laughs> Everyone likes a curveball, uh, David. Everyone likes a curveball. Um, the uh, next question um, is from Jeff. Uh, he's asked, "How important is following a framework such as Safe for Scaled Agile Transformation?" Yeah, I think you need a framework. I think you need a framework, whatever. Now, I, I, I know I said methodology, but actually, most um, most approaches these days are a framework. What you do is you have a framework of approach, and and again. You know, if you've got um, inexperienced people, they can follow the framework closely. If you've got experienced people, you need, they need a, they need the freedom to be creative within the framework. So the answer, your short answer is yes. You, I think it is important. 
Perfect. Um, Lisa has asked, how do you engage with the correct people remotely? Being hands-on and working with the users, having people come to you to raise issues. She's learned that who is on board and who is resisting change. She's struggling to do this remotely. So what would you suggest? Yeah, this is the key. It is the key of uh, connecting to people, getting them on board, what they're doing. You know, the great example being, you know, if you've got, you know, if you've got someone in uh, Sydney, Australia, and you're running a project from the UK, and you ask them to do something for your project, and their boss is just down the hallway from them, then who are they going to listen to over as a priority? So there's a lot of work needs to be done to actually connect a team. And I think a lot. That's why I was saying the earlier. You know, a project manager needs to put a lot of effort into that kind of team bonding uh, approach. Again, it's almost a topic in itself, but you know, I think there are things you can do. You need to make sure that everyone in the project has that visibility of purpose. What are you trying to achieve? Do they understand it? Do they value it? And I think you can you can work with these kind of remote teams by you know sharing the burden of communication. You don't always be the project manager who's leading a meeting and sharing it. You know, if you know, it could be that you know, if we're doing a regular call, you know, then you and me, I'd say, well, next week I'm going to lead the call, and um, you know, I'll, if there's things you want me to talk about, that's fine, but I'll lead the call. And you can share it with with the, the, the you know your community, so they kind of they have to step up, they have to take ownership, and they have to get involved. Um, and there's lots of great stuff around about about that kind of team stuff. And again, I'm you know, I try and share some stuff if people contact me afterwards. Excellent. Um, so last question, I think, from everyone that's asked um, at the moment is by Nathan. He's asked, do you think the role of a project manager could be automated in the future by AI? Absolutely not. <laughs> There's your answer. <laughs> no. no I, think, I think AI is a phenomenal thing and I'm actually working with an AI startup company um, in this area. Um, I think it's fascinating. I, will, I think what we'll do it will take it will take some of the pressure of project managers to do the kind of predictive analysis of, of reporting analysis, all those great stuff that project managers spend a lot of time. And I think it will allow project managers to spend more of their time going back to the people. You know, <laughs> well, I joked at the earlier on about, you know, I came from the age of ex accidental project managers it's, and how do I survive? Because nobody taught me anything when I started. It's because I had some kind of inherent people skills, I guess, you know, I hope I've got better, but I spent all my time, talking to people, getting updates, trying to have a relationship, all that kind of stuff. I mean, it was easy stuff because everybody was in the same building or whatever. I know that. But even so, I think that's how that first generation of project managers was, were successful. Later on, when I learned the mechanics of project management, I realized all the things I hadn't been doing. I think AI is a great supporter and supplement to, to project managers in, in the future. Yeah, there might be some real low end, simple, repetitive type of projects that AI could just actually run its own, almost like a workflow thing, etc. But when there are problems, you need a person to get involved. So I don't think they are going to replace project managers, but I do think they will become a great aid to project managers in the future. <laughs> well, recruitment's slowly starting to go AI with the initial size, so hopefully uh, that's a save for us as well. <laughs> okay, good. You need the human element. Um, but um, to be fair, this last question is just going to be a nice one to sort of end it. Um, so basically, someone wants to know, have the events of the last few months presented any new opportunities for project managers? It certainly presented opportunities for me. And it's, you know, I've you know, converted probably everything I do into a remote delivery, which has been fascinating. Because you can imagine, you know, running a one day workshop or masterclass physically and running it virtually is very, very different. You have to break it down and structure it differently. And mm -hmm. the rest of it. So I've, you know, I've learned to be a lot more flexible in that. And it's, I think it's something that's going to be useful for the future. I think from a project manager's point of view, has it, has it provided opportunities? I think it's generally there's opportunities. Like I said, I think the market will come back. The market is, is in a pause. If you know, it's a lot. I mean, it's not, I mean, I'm still seeing, you know, jobs advertised and people going for jobs and being successful and new people, having new roles, et cetera. But I think, you know, it, re it will resurge quite quickly is my belief. So I think there will be opportunities there. But I think in the meantime, if you're a project manager that's in that quiet period, then, you know, build your network, uh, commit to people, you know, take those extra skills because there's a lot of free stuff out there you can take, um, you know, learn and share your skills. You know, do stuff, you know, keep active and keep working and keep gathering that kind of knowledge through that. Um, and I think you're in a good position when you move forward and, and you know, prove to yourself that you have that capability of, of communicating and team building in a very uh, virtual way means because I think that is definitely going to be the, the way of the future. 
Excellent. Um, thank you. Thanks for an answering all of those questions. Um, I hope everyone has at least took something from, from this. Uh, that's always my bit fit when we do these webinars. Um, but um, it's just been, it's been a great opportunity. Uh, Peter, thank you uh, for sharing your wisdom, plugging your book slightly. <laughs> um, yeah, but if okay. anyone does really need a good read, I, I would highly recommend it. I've read it myself. Uh, and I thought it was a great book. Um, thanks for all your lovely comments already that I can start coming through. Um, basically, what we'll, what's going to happen now is we'll follow up um, with you all with the recording of the session. So you want to go over some points and share it with anybody else. We'll send out a white paper just with some key points um, that we've took from this. Um, we're sharing it on LinkedIn. Um, but for you guys, if you can, once we finish this, really fill out that, um, that thought survey at the end. That's definitely... Uh, going to help us with the next ones and even put some suggestions of what else you guys would like to hear about um thanks peter for taking the time out of your busy day uh, to do this uh, it's been a really good chance to speak to you um and then yeah i think that's everything um it's been a pleasure um and yeah if anyone does have any other questions feel free to connect with peter on linkedin as you can see he's, he's very popular on linkedin so um definitely get in there and definitely send him over some questions and i'm sure he'll be happy to help um well, that's everything i think uh, no other questions i believe um Oh wait, something just popped up in the Q&A. Oh, just someone saying thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, but thanks for taking the time in your evenings. Go and have your tea. <laughs> I think I'm going to go and get a McDonald's. Uh, but yeah, uh, enjoy your evenings and I'm sure we'll all uh, catch up soon. Um, but thank you. Um, and Peter, we'll speak tomorrow. All right, thanks a lot. Bye, Bye. then. Thanks, everyone.